In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll hear each extract once only. Remember, while you're listening, write your answers on the question paper. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with information you hear. Now turn over and look at the notes for extract 1. Mr. Smithers? That's right, Toby Smithers. Now, I think you've been having some stomach problems. Yes, that's right. Uh, for some time, actually. OK. I've got some notes here, but perhaps you can tell me in your own words about those problems. Uh, about any treatment you've been having or anything else you can remember that seems relevant. Mm -hmm. OK. It all started about nine months ago with a stomach upset. OK. Uh, you know, I, I thought I'd caught the vomiting bug that was going round. Yes. <laughs> uh, basically, I just couldn't keep anything down. Mm -hmm. uh, no diarrhoea or anything, but it was pretty bad. Right. Anyway, it cleared up in a couple of days, and I went back to eating normally. The thing was, though, from that time on, whenever I had a meal, lunch or dinner, I'd feel incredibly sleepy almost before I'd finished, and for about half an hour afterwards. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel tired as such, I mean, not in the sense of uh, fatigue. It's just that I could hardly keep my eyes open. I see. Were you in any pain? No, none at all. The only other symptom was that I was getting very thirsty, especially at night, so I was drinking a lot. Right. So I went to see the doctor, expecting some simple explanation, but she said my symptoms were quite unusual. Well, not the drinking. She explained that the stomach upset had left me dehydrated. Yes, that's right. But it didn't explain my other main symptom. And the dehydration passed. Yeah, that was just a temporary thing. Mm -hmm. Then she asked me if I'd ever had stomach cancer, which was a bit worrying. But you haven't. No, no. But then she explained that there's a condition that has similar symptoms to those I had. She didn't think I actually had that condition, because it generally affects people who've had stomach surgery, and I hadn't. It's called gastric dumping syndrome. Oh, yes. Anyway, what she suggested as, well, like an interim measure, was following the treatment plan for that syndrome, even though I probably hadn't got it. Mm -hmm. So I had to keep drinking, because I needed to keep my fluid levels up. Yes. Uh, but not whilst I was eating. So, in other words, I had to separate the two activities by about half an hour. Then, as for the meals themselves, she suggested an eating regime that she called little and often. So, you know, no major blowouts and no skipping meals either. Sure. It, did that help? Yeah, it did, but it was only meant to help me in the short term. Because, meanwhile, I had various tests... Uh, I gave a urine sample, uh, went for a blood test, neither of which showed up anything untoward. So I just hoped it'd clear up of its own accord. But it didn't. Well, no. The regime worked all right, but as soon as I went back to eating and drinking normally, the symptoms would come back. OK. So the doctor referred me for an endoscopy. I saw a gastroenterologist for that. He'd looked at my other test results and examined me and everything. Sure. And of course, once the results of that came back, they showed that I'd got Helicobacter pylori. I see. So I went on the course of treatment, uh, you know, the three drugs for two weeks, yeah. uh, two different antibiotics and an antacid. That's the combination which gets rid of it. Yes. After that, I went back for a breath test, and that was all clear. So I thought that'd be the end of it, and I'd be back to normal. But you're not. <laughs> well, I've given it a couple of months, but the symptoms are the same. OK. 
If I stick to the eating regime, I'm okay. When I come off it, I'm back to square one. So I'm thinking, sure, the stomach problem that the gastroenterologist found has been dealt with, but that wasn't what was causing the original problem. And how's this affecting your everyday life? Uh, I mean, I can live with it. Obviously, it would be different if I was driving for a living or operating machinery, but I'm a teacher, so it's okay. But to cut a long story short, I asked for a second opinion, and so here I am. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, doctor, I have itchy red rash on my feet. Okay. What's your age? Twenty-one, doctor. Tell me if you have developed any associating symptoms or signs. It is tingling persistently, doctor. Since how long have you had this problem? For the past four weeks. Exactly on which part of your foot you are getting this problem? Right great toe, right second toe, right third toe, and right fourth toe. Often the onset of itching starts after removing sweaty socks. Do you drink or smoke? I do not smoke, but I do drink. Have you had any diseases in the past? Well, I had chicken pox and frequent ear infections. You had any surgeries as well? I have surgical ear tubes. Do you take any medications? No, doctor. Are you allergic to any medicine or substances? Well, I get a severe rash when I access adhesive tape. Any of your family members have any history of illness? My paternal grandmother is having cataracts, and my maternal aunt has migraines. Well, your physical examination reports show blood pressure 110 over 64, respiratory rate is 18, heart rate is 66, and temperature is 98.6. Lower extremities is warm to cool. Proximal to distal. The dorsalis pedis artery pulse palpable bilateral. Posterior tibial artery pulse palpable bilateral. No edema observed. Varicosities are not observed. Right great toe, right second toe, right third toe, and right fourth toenail show erythema and scaling. Muscle strength is 5 out of 5 for all groups tested. Muscle tone is normal. Inspection and palpation of bones, joints, and muscles is unremarkable. You have developed tinea pedis, a fungal culture of skin from right toes. KOH test shows no visible microbes. I am prescribing Lotrimin AF 1% cream to apply four times a day. And Griseofulvin 250 milligrams PO once in eight hours for four weeks. That is the end of Part A. Now look at Part B.
Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a consultant talking to a woman whose father has just been admitted to hospital. Now read the question. So we've talked about the various things that might have caused your father to collapse. A lot of times we investigate multiple symptoms so as to rule out any life-threatening conditions. So it could take some time to get to the bottom of the problem? Possibly. In the meantime, he's quite stable now and we're encouraged by the progress that he's making. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, but at least he's not in any great discomfort, is he? According to the assessment at the bedside by his nurse, his pain is well controlled and we'll try to keep his sedation at an adequate level until we're ready to begin treatment. Question 26. You hear a trainee nurse receiving feedback from her tutor about the ward round she's just completed. Now read the question. How do you feel your ward round went with that patient? Oh, I really should have told him what I was about to do, rather than just rolling up his sleeve to take his blood pressure. Yeah, it would have been preferable, but at least you realise. Oh, thanks. I think you did your observations really well, though. You checked the patient's details are correct, you put the date in, you timed it correctly, you observed that all your parameters are within normal range. And you did the respiratory rate while you were doing your manual pulse. Yes, the pulse was quite strong and regular. And you could have passed that on to reassure the patient too. Oh. But you look back at the previous observations, put your signature at the bottom. That's all good. Thanks, OK. Question 27. You hear a hospital nurse briefing a colleague about a patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD. Now read the question. So, who's next? The patient in bed 12. Mm -hmm. She had a fall at home about a month ago, but she's otherwise independent with her day-to-day -day activities. Mm -hmm. Her falls risk is high given her recent history. She's been assessed by the physio, and she's on a rollator frame to ambulate. Her skin integrity is intact, and she's responded well to all treatment. Good. She's on a normal diet. Mm -hmm. The observations were last done at 6 a.m., and they were stable. Her medications are IV tazacin due at 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. and prednisone next due at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Okay. You need to check with the doctors today whether she'll continue with the IV antibiotics and whether the cannula can be removed. Mm -hmm. At this stage, they're aiming for discharge in a couple of days' time, pending discharge from the physio and also ceasing IV antibiotics. Okay, thanks. Question 28. You hear a discussion between a doctor and a nurse about autoimmune liver disease. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the autoimmune liver disease? Well, autoimmune hepatitis primary biliary cirrhosis, 
and primary sclerosing cholangitis are the three most common forms of autoimmune liver disease. Autoimmune hepatitis is characterized by high levels of serum, alanine aminotransferase, and aspartate aminotransferase, whereas primary biliary cirrhosis and primary sclerosing cholangitis are associated with predominant elevations of alkaline phosphatase since they are cholestatic disorders. Primary biliary cirrhosis and autoimmune hepatitis are associated with autoantibodies in the serum, such as antinuclear antibody, smooth muscle antibody, and anti-mitochondrial antibody. Primary sclerosing cholangitis usually affects the extrahepatic biliary system. Thus, if it is present, abnormalities can be seen on imaging. Question 29. You hear a discussion about brain chemicals involved in mood regulation. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the brain chemicals involved in mood regulation? Well, basically, there are three molecules, chemically known as monoamines, that are involved in mood regulation. Serotonin has been coined the brain's feel-good chemical. Norepinephrine is another neurotransmitter connected with depression and how alert the feelings are. A low level of norepinephrine is considered to be associated with the brain fog that many people with depression experience whereas low levels of dopamine in a part of the brain called the substantia nigra associated with Parkinson's disease. But there is much more to dopamine. In the frontal lobes of the brain, it is associated with complex thinking and problem solving. In fact, it is considered that the stimulatory effects of chemicals such as nicotine and cocaine are related to their effects on the dopamine-mediated reward centers in the brain. Question 30. You hear a discussion about different types of gastric juices. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What are the different types of gastric juices? Well, the food we swallow mixes with gastric juices secreted by special glands in the lining of the stomach. They include the cardiac glands at the top part of the stomach, the oxyntic glands in the main part of the stomach, and the pyloric glands in the antrum or lowest part of the stomach. Therefore, each of the glands contains cells that produce specific components that are called the gastric juices. Next cells produce bicarbonate and mucus. Parietal cells generate hydrochloric acid. Chief cells produce pepsinogen. And enteroendocrine cells generate various hormones. Hydrochloric acid is a strong acid secreted by the parietal cells, and it lowers the pH level of the stomach to around 2. Hydrochloric acid converts pepsinogen into pepsin and breaks various nutrients apart from the food we eat. It also destroys bacteria that comes along with the food. Gastric lipase is another digestive enzyme made by the chief cells. It helps break down short and medium chain fats. Amylase is also found in gastric juices, but it isn't made by the stomach. This enzyme comes from saliva and travels along the bolus into the stomach. Amylase breaks down carbohydrates, but doesn't have much time to work on the stomach because the acidity stops it. Intrinsic factor is secreted by the parietal cells and is necessary to absorb vitamin B12. This is essential for healthy nervous system function and blood cell production. Finally, the gastric juices contain water and mucus. The mucus is secreted by the neck cells and helps coat and protect the stomach lining from the acid environment.
That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear an interview with Dr Bob Dean, who's talking about a trial he conducted to assess different ways of treating the condition known as tennis elbow. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. The condition, commonly called tennis elbow, is a painful condition of the tendons which interferes with tasks involving gripping and manipulating objects. A recent trial led by Dr. Bob Dean has tried to see what type of therapy works best. Bob, is there a typical way that tennis elbow starts? It's a very common condition, but apart from tennis players themselves and people working in industries where they do certain manual tasks, it's surprisingly difficult for patients to pin down the actual start of the pain. And even with those high-risk activities, it's generally something that comes on over a period of time. In tennis, it used to be said it was down to the player's grip or the type of racket they were using, but nobody's really researched that thoroughly. There are plenty of guidelines out there, but they're not evidence-based. When somebody has pain, then modifying their tools, whether that's a tennis racket or something at work, may well help. But that doesn't necessarily mean there's a causal link. So what was your approach in the trial you conducted? Well, we divided our patients into three groups. One group followed a physiotherapy programme. Another was asked to do nothing to see if the condition just went away by itself the wait-and-see group, we called them, and people in the third group were given steroid injections. The physiotherapy we used was a specific elbow manipulation. The therapist applies manual force to the elbow joint, and at the same time, the patient actually performs the kind of task that causes the pain. The aim is to apply the force in a way that relieves that particular pain. But just as important is the physical activity the therapy calls for, because in most tennis elbow patients, their muscle system's quite debilitated. And I understand that complete rest wasn't seen as an option? Instead, you describe something called smart rest? Resting's an interesting thing. Immobilising the arm in a sling is probably the worst thing anyone with tennis elbow can do. In fact, resting most muscular skeletal pain isn't good. What we advocate is something called smart rest, and what this means is being as lively, as dynamic as possible, but not hurting the elbow. 
An example is where patients avoid picking things up with their palm facing down, which is classic advice given to anyone with a condition. But patients do need the stimulus of movement to help rehabilitation. And so all our participants were given advice on how to manage their condition ergonomically, even the wait-and-see group. The difference was they didn't get any other form of treatment, whereas our other two groups did. So what were the results? What we found was that steroid injections were more effective in the first six weeks, but not after that. The physiotherapy group also reported good results at six weeks, comparable to those for the injection group, and much better than those reported by the wait-and-see group. But then, after three months, the situation had changed. The physiotherapy group was now reporting better results than the injection group, and, remarkably, so was the wait-and-see group. Indeed, they were catching up all round, so much so that after six months, physiotherapy is no more effective than doing nothing. At 12 months, and what's fascinating is that with a second study to show this, the recovery rate for people who do nothing was 70 to 80%. So what does all this mean for patients? What advice would you give them on the strength of this trial? I'd say, in the first instance, rest the elbow and see how it is in three months. If it hasn't resolved itself by then, they're probably one of those 20 to 30% who aren't going to get better. At that stage, I'd recommend they have some sensible physiotherapy. I don't think there's much evidence to support the use of steroid injections until a really good attempt's been made with the wait-and-see approach backed up by physiotherapy. But it's still worth trying at that stage because the alternative could be some quite drastic measures, even possibly surgery. I see. Now, it's quite common for people to think that if something's sore and swollen, they've got to take anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen. Are they right? Well, there have been various studies about this, and what they've found is that there's little evidence of inflammation in tennis elbow. So there's no reason to think that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are going to be very beneficial. So I suspect that just taking basic over-the-counter pain relief would be at least as successful as taking anti-inflammatory drugs in the case of tennis elbow. Now look at Extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. You hear a presentation in which a researcher called Dr Sarah Jones is talking on the subject of weight loss interventions by GPs. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
My name's Dr. Sarah Jones. Today, I'm going to be talking about brief interventions for weight loss. What that basically means is helping patients to get started on the road to losing weight, and I'll be introducing you to some exciting new work on the subject. I've been interested in obesity for a long time, and it's an issue that matters. Two-thirds of adults in this country are overweight or obese, so I absolutely recognise that we need interventions which can be part of routine care. The reality is, however, that relatively few practitioners actually make such interventions, despite the fact that this is an established part of clinical guidelines in many parts of the world. Now, why is that? One reason, I think, is that they tend to have an attitude that goes, what can I really achieve in a brief intervention? Now, that's a reasonable concern. But when we did a review of weight management services led by health professionals, there were so few of them that it was difficult to know whether or not they made much difference. As a result, we decided to do our own trial, which we called Brief Interventions for Weight Loss. What we did was train GPs to make a very brief 30-second intervention with every patient coming into their routine clinics who had a BMI greater than 30. Basically a brief chat, saying, while you're here, have you thought about the benefits of losing some weight? The reason for doing this was to get patients who weren't really thinking about their weight to focus on it for a moment. If the doctor raises the issue in this way, we can capitalise on that heightened awareness by offering them support. By referring them to a program, we can create lasting motivation to lose weight. So, that was the theory. How did it work out? What I'm going to say next should provide huge reassurance to practitioners. Our first step was to conduct a survey of 500 likely candidates for the trial. Although weight remains a very delicate, personal issue in the public domain, only a tiny proportion of those surveyed thought it was inappropriate for their doctor to discuss weight loss on a professional basis. Given the need for urgent action on the issue, I think that's a pretty strong mandate. Anyway, as I said, this was a trial, so there were two groups of patients. With patients in the first group, the doctor formally raised the issue of weight and offered a referral to a weight management program. For patients in the other group, which was the control group, the doctor simply said, it would be good for your health if you lost some weight. So what happened when this weight loss intervention was trialled? Well, the answer is that three quarters of those offered referrals said, yes, doctor, I'd like to do that. That was an excellent start, but we're realists. And of course, they didn't actually all turn up. But nonetheless, a large number did. Of those who accepted the referral, more than half attended the program. Now, that's a fantastic result, exceeding our expectations, and indeed most of them completed it. So given that it was a completely unselected, totally opportunistic intervention, we were quite encouraged at the uptake for this program. But of course the crunch is, what happened to their weight? Well, at three months, people in both groups had lost weight. The control group, you remember they'd simply been advised to lose weight, but were left to their own devices in terms of what they did about it, now, they'd lost 1.75 kilos on average. Meanwhile, the group attending a weight management program had lost significantly more, about 3 kilos. When we followed both groups up again at 12 months, patients in both remained below their baseline weight, but the intervention group had again done significantly better than those people left to manage their weight independently. This is an interesting trial because it allows us to model what the effect would be if GPs made this kind of brief intervention more widely, just once a year for each eligible patient. So how scalable are the results? By 2035, run countrywide, such an approach could reduce the prevalence of obesity by half. 
That's a dramatic result, showing that these brief interventions not only help individuals, but could also lead to huge gains for everyone in terms of better health and reduced health care costs alone. So, to sum up, I guess what I want to convey to you is that brief, opportunistic interventions from a doctor to encourage weight loss, when made in a supportive manner, are really to be encouraged. Thank you. That is the end of Part C.